Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike. I'm here with Merch. Say hello, Merch. Hello, Merch. <laughs> well, following up that little ditty, do you have a favorite dad joke? Uh, I do. It's it's a little bit of a walk, but that's kind of why I love it. Um, if that's okay. Or I can tell a shorter one. No, nah, take, take me for a walk, my boy. All right. So... There's this penguin. He's driving along. He's driving to Las Vegas, actually. And, you know, road to Vegas. Nothing out there. Starts hearing some weird noises out of his car. He goes, uh-oh. Better, uh, better go get that checked out. So he finds the nearest mechanic. He uh, goes in. Mechanic. He's like, oh, I'm on, uh, I'm on my lunch break. But uh, give me half an hour. I'll, uh, I'll go check it out. Okay, what's there to do in this little town for half an hour? It's like, well, you're a penguin. It's hot. I bet you want to cool off. He's like, yeah, that sounds that sounds nice actually. And I was like, well, there's this really nice ice cream shop right down the road. It's like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. So the penguin waddles over there and uh, walks in the ice cream shop. It's like, I would like one large just vanilla Sunday. I was like, all right, hands in the vanilla Sunday, hands him a spoon, you know, penguins. They don't, they can't really use spoons. They have those little flippers. So he just kind of scoops it into his mouth. Uh, very nice ice cream. Very nice, very nice day. Kind of waddles back to the mechanic realizes that he's got some ice cream all over his face, but it's on his hands too. So he can't really clean himself off. Um, so, you know, he's got vanilla ice cream, kind of just plaster over his face. And he walks over to the mechanic, and the mechanic's under the car, and he's like, well, any, uh, any idea what's going on? And the mechanic goes, yeah, looks like you blew a seal. <laughs> nice. So, Merch, what's your favorite underutilized word? Uh, my favorite underutilized word uh, would be decimate. So I love the origins of the word and um, it's kind of adopted a second meaning through like pop culture and just how it's used today is just very different than its original use. Originally it was uh, a like Roman army practice where they would defeat another army, uh, capture up all the soldiers and then kill, like reduce them by one tenth. So kill one in 10 of them. Um, kind of man I mean it makes sense as far as like you captured soldiers you want to put the fear of God into them uh, in that case literally yeah, literally um, and you I mean the way it's used now is probably almost the opposite where it's like to reduce to one tenth almost you kill almost everything but uh I don't know why. Just the word, it sounds very, uh, it's a good sound to it, in my opinion. Yeah. It's, a, it's so, a very but clean word. Its original meaning was to reduce by one-tenth, not yeah. to reduce to one-tenth. Right. Therefore, deci being yeah. ten, mate. So yeah. take away it, one, like destroy one-tenth, where yeah. the way we think of it now is to destroy two one-tenth almost, like to yeah. cripple or, just, yeah. Yeah, just totally just them. wipe everything out. Yeah. So if you ever found yourself channel surfing again in this time of YouTube and the internets, what movie would you never skip? Movie would I never skip? Um, I think... Probably my favorite, just kind of. I mean, it's just a, it's a bad movie, but uh, it's called Zombie Beavers. Oh yeah, um, that movie is terrible in the best kind of way. It's just, it's absolutely awful. It has like, I think it's like self. It's like one of like the self aware ones where it's like, yeah, yeah, this is terrible, but it's it's just the right kind of terrible. It was like the first Sharknado or right, yeah. It knew what it, it knew what it was there to do. Yeah, had no had no delusions of grandeur. Had, well, you know, wasn't yeah. trying to be high art. Was very clearly trying to be a you know 
a fun B movie romp, and it really, I think that yeah. one really achieved. Oh, it, it it hits all of it. It's all like the classic, just like scary movie tropes that I mean, it just makes fun of it. Honestly, yeah, it's a it's a great hokey film. Highly yeah. recommend. Um. Also, the movie Rubber. I have a I love that yeah. movie. That, just some... that movie is a little gets a little high arty, but is in the same kind of vein, <sighs> right? Of just like absurdism, <sighs> movie, but... but it definitely. The person who made it definitely went to like an art school, but right. <laughs> before picking up a camera. Well, like the way I see that movie, it's like someone like clearly went to like art and like film school, and was like, "Wow, these people see meaning in literal anything." Yeah. And so I'm gonna, you know, it's it's like making fun of yeah. that. In my opinion, it's like, wow, this is the dumbest premise you'd ever see a tire rolling around just killing people with its mind yeah, blowing shit up and then like in the movie like i think those are the people that are like being preachy about like seeing hidden meanings in places which i think when i first watched that movie i think i was in high school and i just have this deep hatred for english class <laughs> um and i think it's because it's all subjective yeah. And it's like, well, what do you think the author meant by that? I'm like, I don't know. He died 200 years ago. I don't know how <laughs> I'm supposed to figure out what he meant by that. It's not like my chemistry class where I can go run a test. It's yeah. what do you think this guy meant by that? My, the thing I really hate about that kind of logic is when you have those discussions in an art class, you state your opinion, you have like perspective to back it up. And then like the teacher's like, you're wrong. It's like, how right. can I be wrong? We're all just, you know, <laughs> making things up based upon, you know, what we saw and making a conclusion based upon imperfect information. Yes. I mean, it's, it's like, just... it's the like, that episode of South Park where they write, they just try to write oh, the most yeah. graphic book they can Screaming possibly think. Balls. Yeah. And then it sparks as like, he's the most liberal character there is. It's like, what are you talking about? And they're just talking about details that have nothing to do with anything to support their case. And... And the best part to me is the kids are, like, in the bookstore where people are having these, like, highfalutin bullshit conversations. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, no, that's not what they meant. Like, how would you know? It's like, well, we're <laughs> fucking writers. <laughs> exactly. There was a great, um, on the Cracked podcast a millennia ago, it feels like, mm -hmm. they were talking to one of the writers from The Simpsons. Um, oh, I can't remember, quite remember his name. But he was talking about how he was at some, uh, like an art school or something like that, and took this uh, art history or this film history class, and they watched the original King Kong. Mm -hmm. And the original King Kong, when he gets brought back, he's like wrecking havoc on New York. He um, destroys the L train. And the professor broke it down. He's like, well, the reason this is in the film is because there was this worker strike during the blah, 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 blah. And goes off on this, like, artist interpretation of strife and the American people and yada, yada, yada. Right. And the guy's like, oh, that's that's fascinating. You know, art can represent so much. I never saw it like that. It's so, you know. And then years later, he watches the DVD commentary where they actually, before his passing, talk to the guy that created the movie. Mm -hmm. and they're like you know it's like happening through the scene they're like why did you destroy the L train because it's specifically the L train I guess and he's just like yeah I used to live in that um, apartment complex near the L train and got woken up every day at 3 in the morning when the L train started coming back around and I told myself if I ever made a fucking movie I'd destroy that god awful train it's just like, like yeah, sometimes just, human beings yeah. are really simple creatures that are vindictive. <laughs> like, we're, we just, don't have to be complex and, like... It's just revenge like, porn for him watching yeah, a giant monkey like, beat up that train. Yeah. I love it. Take it to task. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's like, yeah, sometimes we're a little bit more simple than we like to believe. I mean, speaking of cracks, um, I just remember there was, like, one of the little... If you ever watched, like, the After Hours series? Yeah. Um... It's just like one like throwaway line at the end. He's like, hey, do you guys ever think that we uh, think about movies and TV shows more than the writers themselves? And we just <laughs> interpret our own meaning into it. 
and uh, it's just such a good little like end of the episode throwaway line that it's yeah. just it just encapsulates all of that yeah it's so true so growing up merch did you have a favorite book uh favorite book i didn't read a whole lot as a kid um was part of undiagnosed adhd for a really long time um so if something didn't really kind of capture my attention then uh, i just couldn't read it um one of the first books i remember like reading for school and like genuinely liking was ender's game um it's kind of a classic but outside of that i would say probably like the hobbit lord of the rings trilogy um uh, you hit on one of my good friends and guess the podcast max's pick and you hit on my pick all right <laughs> and good company um but i remember like reading enders i think i read it in, like fifth grade or something and it's like oh that's it was just like kind of a unique concept to me at the time where um that was almost like my first foray into like sci-fi mm-hmm. um and then from there uh whoops same thing like lord of the rings uh kind of like my first like real foray into like fantasy stuff maybe like harry potter was first but um that's like i mean those are my favorite lord of the rings my favorite movies of all time i have you know the inscription on the ring of the ring tattooed on me so oh sweet i actually did not know that uh i don't think i've seen you since i got it done so oh, okay well, yeah, yeah. Speaking of valuable things, if you had to evacuate your house, what's the first thing you would grab? Um, I mean, my cat, probably. But otherwise, non-living things that can get herself out. She's not being stupid. Um, I have like a framed set of the original uh, 151 Pokemon. Um, oh, that's like awesome. The fir- their their first printings, so it's like through base base set, uh, fossil and jungle. Um, and the reason I love that thing so much is I got crazy anal with like making like it's like it's like a grid display. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like crazy anal with like making all the lines straight, everything. I had a little like guide three D printed. And I got it like super nice and I wasn't like really happy with it, honestly, but I was like, I'd, I'd restarted like twice and it took like four hours to do each time. Jeez. It's yeah, like, so all right, fine. It's good only, enough. Yeah. Not only this thing that you love and collected, but also something that you put a lot of work into, you know, right. like making just the way you like it. But then I got it all framed and everything and hung up in my, hung up on my wall and one of my friends was over, and she was like, oh, which one's your favorite Pokemon? And I was like, oh, of those, probably Charizard. And she's like, oh, which one's that? And so I told her where it should be, like, in the lineup, because it's all, uh, like, Pokedex numbers mm-hmm. order. And she noticed that the Squirtle and Charizard, or Squirtle and Charmander lines were swapped. Oh, no. So they're in the wrong spot. But at this point, I'm just not going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's kind of like a fun wrinkle rather than right. annoying, you know. Fact. It's like a little, hey, spot the mistake. Because I don't think anyone's seen it and noticed it without me being like, hey, guess what's in the wrong spot. <laughs> That's so cool. What comes to mind when I say the word underrated? Underrated. Um, I mean, my mind just goes straight to sports. Um, probably, uh, I mean, I'll just go back to, uh, last year. Um, I made a decent amount, uh, betting on the Arizona Cardinals because all the sports book, they were just very underrated. Um, so it's like, it's being able to kind of spot things that maybe other people don't see or other uh other players don't see other I mean, whoever's whoever else is comparing looking at the thing you're looking at being able to see kind of in better detail than them 
kind of hidden traits. Is that something you've been doing for a while? Sports betting? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm a full-on degenerate gambler. Well, I knew that, but yeah. when it comes to sports... Well, sports betting, I feel like um, I have an edge, um, you know. As even an though, athlete? Um, as an athlete, um, I mean, I made a good amount of money uh, betting on the Olympics. Uh, like, the swimming event specifically, because that's, I mean, that's the one I follow closely, and I figure I was more informed than some of the books, even. Uh, and so... What were some of the events that you picked out the most where they had it just wrong, in your opinion? Well, it's not that they got it wrong. Like, they had the favorite, they had the correct favorite, but they really underestimated um, the odds of someone besides the favorite winning. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, it's uh, the one I made the most money on was. Uh, the men's 1500, um, you know, no American had won that event in, I don't know, 40 years or something. Um, and the guy, the American in it, uh, his name is Bobby Fink, uh, just watching him race throughout in his other events. Uh, he, I, I think like he was getting like three to one to win. And I mean, he, which is ridiculous because he won the next longest. So that he won the second longest event earlier in the meet in like spectacular fashion where he was, you know, behind by almost like three seconds going to the last lap and chased the guy down. And then I, look, I mean, I looked at that one. I was like, he's going to do this again in the mile. Like, there's no reason he can't. And that one was even better. Like, it was beautiful. It was like one of the best swam races I've ever seen in my life. And that's one of the ones where like I put my money in and I watched it and it's a good one because it's like a 15 minute long race. And the whole time I'm like, God, I'm so smart for making this bet. So it was like just a 15 minute long patting myself on the back. Um, even though he was never in the lead until like the midway through the, the last lap. Um, he was always like right there. And then uh, I think he outsplit. Like his last lap was um, faster than the next two guys by. I mean, he went in third of the wall, and I think he won by five meters. Oh, wow. like, which I mean, if you if you don't know swimming, but it, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, just going third to getting first in the last lap is still yeah. So, and like the last fifty meters, he was like he was just going like fifteen percent faster than the next two people, just just chilling with him the whole time and then flip it on bang. Yeah. It but seems yeah, it's like, like a story that I've heard constantly in Olympics is like, you just need the, the, like there's so many success stories I've heard where it's just like, you need to keep pace and then just mm -hmm. have a, you know, speed boost in the chamber for that last, you know, X amount, whether it's, I remember somebody did it in like, I think it was the decathlon or the triathlon. Mm-hmm all like 2012 it was this irish guy and he just he had trained literally to be able to sprint the last 200 meters yep of the foot race and just like they're like oh it looks like it's gonna be this guy again <laughs> this guy just like yeah picked up his kilt or whatever and just vroom, just like took off it's like whoa i realize well, that's technically yeah. incorrect considering irish people don't wear kilts but screw you this is my podcast i mean like the olympics specifically um I don't, it's probably different in some of the other events, but, uh, for swimming, um, I think just kind of in general, like race events, the times don't matter really. You're not going to show someone your gold medal and someone's going to be like, Oh, what time did you go? And like, they're mm -hmm. gonna be like, Oh damn, that's a gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's more about like racing, like then the time you go race, like the time you went in, in the race, it's just, you put your hand on the wall before the other guy. Like it couldn't, yeah. it would, doesn't matter if it's the slowest gold medal ever. It's a gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> Scoreboard. Just right. Like. <laughs> exactly. How many gold medals do you have, sir? 
That being said, the natural progression of I, th- I sent you this relatively recently of the somebody made a video shot of like I think it was, was it oh like, just swim record. I think it was the hundred freestyle. Yeah, it was a couple different swim records from yeah. you know back in the day versus today, and it's just like the amount that we as a human species when you know competing in sport have improved is just like ridiculous right it's like we were we're and different it, you know we're, we're different species from then and now it's just ridiculous it's like not oh, a lot of that is uh like technology um yeah. just um better training habits you know i mean probably see, for some of them it might just be training in general right because like, like back a lot in the of day it. Like, I don't think they were paid that, like, a lot of them weren't paid that much until they were, like, all-stars. And so while you're mm. getting to be good in your best years, you're probably working a second job, you're going to school, like, right. you have, like, a normal life. Like, I remember, what was it, there was, back in the day, like, there's some baseball teams that, in the off-season, had a normal job. It's like, right. that affects how good you're going to be at baseball. 100%. When for, you know, half the year you were stocking You're just like an accountant or, or yeah. Yeah. You're, just <laughs> you're doing not something. just like, yeah, you're not just being in the peak physical shape at training, keeping your eye like, you know, perfect for hitting a curve or whatever like that. It's just like, yeah, it, it right. changes your output when it's not 100% of your life. Yeah. And the, I, mean, I think you, it might have your life be like more slanted in one particular direction, but. I mean, you see like, uh, second most decorated swimmer of all time like mark spitz won seven gold medals in olympics and he's walking up to the blocks like he's fully covered in hair i think he had a beard at the time like smoking a a cigarette fat mustache yeah yeah he was not trimmed down to be like you know water fluid or whatever like that. right he wasn't he wasn't ready to become one with the sea Mm -hmm. and i actually uh i think maybe it was a ted talk they were talking about uh, kind of like the limits in like uh, like the record books because like humans probably have a limit to like what they can do with their bodies. Yeah, like physically. Yeah. yeah. Um. But uh, then it so like it, it was like a progression of I think it was the same race, the hundred meter freestyle. Um. Like the world record, just kind of as a graph. And there was like big dips places. And then it was pretty steady and then a big dip. Um, and like all those big dips come when like technology changes. Like one of the yeah. big dips was like gutters in the pool as opposed to just being a wall. So like you're swimming through less waves. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, another changes one. The, the amount of like friction that you have to like surpass basically, right? Yeah, I mean, again, if you if you've never like been a swimmer, um, it's kind of hard to because um, there's not really a, a medium. It doesn't like translate well to land, but it's almost like running into a headwind if there's like waves. Well, I mean, uh, it's like if you're playing beach volleyball and there's more sand versus less sand, right? The less sand there is, the easier it is to move quicker. Sure. The more sand that you have, it like yeah. your foot's going to sink in farther. Yeah. So like the more waves that you're having to having to tread through is just like more friction and more depth that you're having to like overcome, yeah. and like remove and, yourself from. Yeah. So like, uh, so that was a big one, and then like they, uh, like the invention of like the flip turn. So like where they flip in the wall instead of like touching yeah. and turning around, um, that was oh, a big yeah. drop. And then how long was that until that was like kind of in the, you know, lexicon of most swimmers? Um, well, I think there was like a rule change that made it pot that made it legal as opposed to it just being illegal somewhere in the sixties. Oh, interesting. I could be wrong. Um, I just assumed that people didn't think of like think to do it. Maybe that's a little, maybe that's not giving credit to our forefathers, but I mean, it's very, it's possible. Um, it's a, it's a weird thing to think to do. To like, because again, that's just not something you'd ever see on land. Like if you were running somewhere and then had to turn around, you wouldn't do a front flip and then yeah. push off the other way. <laughs> Unless you watched anime. And or just deep into parkour. <laughs> 
So moving back to the questions of the pod, is there a best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Um, anything worth doing is worth doing wrong. Um, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it kind of helped me through when I was kind of struggling with depression. Um, you know, I don't know if you or anyone listening has ever kind of struggled with anything like that, but there's just basic tasks that are, they just, they just fall by the wayside, you know, stuff like, you know, brushing your teeth, showering, like regularly, like basically like hygiene stuff really kind of falls apart. Um, mm -hmm when you get like into that really bad headspace, And so, um, brushing your teeth for 20 seconds is better than not doing it at all. Yeah. Um, kind of just sitting in the, sitting in the shower, just, it's just better than not. Yeah. Um, so it's, don't be afraid to, uh, do the minimum acceptable amount. Um, yeah. of course it depends on what you're doing. I probably don't recommend <laughs> you doing this at your job, but, <laughs> but I mean, it's better to go into work right. than to like to call not out show sick. up. Yeah. Right. It's better to show up, kind of keep your head down and do a little bit of work as opposed to just not be there at all. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of those ones that sounds counterintuitive, but then once you put it into practice, you see the value in it. It's almost like you're tricking yourself. Because, like, most of the time, in my experience, I recently heard a, a message such as that, that was, you know, just do, instead of, you know, like, for writing, just do a minute. Just write one page. Just, you know, do just do the bare minimum. And mm. what you usually end up doing is you end up doing more. Right. And it's just, like, tricking yourself into taking the first step in a direction that you want to go. And then, usually, your second foot will just naturally go there. It's just the problem mm. is getting that first step in you know showing up to work just brushing your teeth at all just you know yeah. getting yourself wet with water so that you're clean like stuff like that so yeah that yeah. that one is that one is a sneaky all-timer to be sure yeah i think there was a uh, i was listening to uh daniel o'brien he was interviewing michael swaim like recently and you're saying like, yeah, I have this intense writer's block. And the way I get through that is I go to my computer and I intentionally write the hottest steaming pile of garbage I can think <laughs> of. And then I would just get mad at myself for like, how could you put this in the paper? And then like, then I'm through my writer's block. <laughs> yeah. And then you start writing good things because anything is better than that. Yeah. Cause, cause like, yeah. like, all right, I cannot possibly write anything worse than what I have just written. <laughs> That's awesome. I might have to try that out. So from that story, do you have a favorite story to tell from your life? An anecdote of excellence perchance? Yeah. Um, it just kind of goes back to um, kind of letting... Well, so when I was in high school, um, I was, uh, you know, a really good swimmer. Um, my last high school swim meet, uh, I was going into one of my races. Um, it was me or this, uh, hotshot kid from another school. Uh, he was a freshman. Uh, he's super talented swimmer. I think he ended up swimming at Berkeley. Um, he, it's me or him who's going to win the race. And me being the, you know, kind of character that I was at the time I have dyed my hair like neon green um so, you know my school color was green and then spending any time in the pool kind of makes it fade so my hair is just the color of Mountain Dew <laughs> and uh you know we're we're in the warm-up pool um I think he's in the lane next to me and I hear him like talking just major trash about me it's like, oh, I'm going to wipe the floor with this kid. He's not even, he's, you know, well, he's not good or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's a freshman and I'm like a 6'3", relatively like built swimmer at this point. And I just kind of, I just like kind of stand over him and I'm like, what'd you say to me? 
And he got like <laughs> super nervous. Like he was not expecting me to be there or anything. And as we're walking over the blocks, uh, he like comes up and he tries like, Hey, like I was just like kind of talking. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, fucking back up that talk. And he was like, <laughs> still kind of just taken aback. And like, he was like nervous. And then, uh, I would have beat him anyway, but he flinched on the block. And so he got disqualified, <laughs> which ended up being the difference in my team winning the championship as opposed to his team. <laughs> <laughs> like the 13 points he would have gotten from that race would have been enough for them to win. And so it's be it's like mental toughness kind of a thing. You can't be cocky if you can't, yeah. you know, don't start nothing. Right. You know, it's the classic. <laughs> don't talk the talk. If you can't walk the walk. Yeah. So like, don't leave I, the guy out there talking I, shit unless you're willing to stand behind right. it. I, sure. I absolutely love that story <laughs> where, you know, I don't, I don't know that, I'm the one who got in his head and, or if it was just all of his teammates putting a bunch of pressure on him or, but I just, I give myself credit for that one. <laughs> <laughs> done punked the punk. Yeah. If you could work any of the jobs you've done over the course of your life, but get paid the same as the job where you made the most, which job would you work? Um, still just swim coach. Um, it's honestly the only job I've had. That is, that I enjoy, honestly. Um, I couldn't possibly sit behind a desk, <laughs> do anything like that um, for eight hours a day. It would drive me insane. Um, it's just... What, uh, what level and what uh, age range are you uh, swim coach? Uh Currently, um, I'm working with uh, 11 to 13 year olds, which is uh, one of my favorite ages to work with. It'd be like them and then probably college kids that I've worked with. Um, high schoolers are super hit and miss. They're really frustrating because, <laughs> uh, you know, the ones with talent, you just see a lot more wasted talent in high school kids because... Uh, Oh my God, I want to go do X, Y, and Z with my friends. And it's like that yeah. instead of like kind of taking things as seriously, which I mean, I have a social life and everything. Um, you know, I definitely got burned out of swimming and it negatively affected my performance or down the line. Um, but when it comes to like the expense of like training and, you see kids that kind of they're over putting the work in, but then they're also simultaneously disappointed with their results. It's, it's hard just to not be a sarcastic asshole in those kids. Yeah. And it's like, well, coach, why didn't I drop a bunch of time in this event? I'm like, well, you've come to three practices a week. <laughs> I don't know what you expected to do. Yeah. It shouldn't have been that though. <laughs> right. Um, so like you see that waste the talent in like high school kids a lot, but you also get the kids that are like super driven, not super talented though. Mm -hmm. And like, so that's super rewarding when like, you know, when hard work trumps talent. Yeah. Is it, um, have you ever seen the, the tragic, like rock Lee story, if you will, of somebody who's got the fire, but not either, you know, the talent required or the physicality and they're, trying something that they are either maybe too far behind or just don't have the capacity to achieve. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen that. Um, some of the hardest, like one of the hardest working kids, uh, like I ever coached, um, you just, for whatever reason, the neurons don't fire the right way and is, uh, he just can't make himself do the right or everything he's doing is correct. It's just for whatever reason, he's unable to swim fast through the water. Um, kind of honestly kind of stumped me as a coach for a little bit. Um, but I mean, he's still good, but he's mm -hmm. not, you know, someone with that work ethic, uh, 
I mean, he's come such a such a long way, but there is, I think, there is like a physical, like a barrier um, mm-hmm. to how far like just hard work can get you. Um, there does need to be a little bit of a natural talent somewhere in there. Yeah, that's that's one of the more heartbreaking ones to see. It's a it's a beautiful thing to see like that kind of hard work, but when it doesn't get rewarded, it's right. It's rough. Well, like my uh, my swim coach in college, he uh, he's probably like five foot five. Um, his wife, I think, is five four, and his he had a, like a five year old son at the time when he told this story. He's like, yeah, my kid was like, he's starting to play basketball and stuff, and he said he wants to be like a center in the NBA. I was like, I didn't have the heart to tell him that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, you remember Noah Kessel, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's like, stands all of five, five, maybe? <laughs> maybe. With lifts and, and his shoes, I, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I remember having a conversation with him where he's like, yeah, I'm going to get this growth spurt and start playing like ball and like, he he had some hops to him and like you know yeah. natural like you know kind of athleticism and competition like competitive spirit and I was like okay like how old are you he's like oh I'm like you know seventeen I'm like I hate to break it to you kid if you would have had a, if you're gonna have a growth spurt it would have been already like we're, we're uh, I mean a little like late in the season uh I mean males particularly um I don't know why there's multiple stories of uh. Like guys in college going through, re- re- like reasonable size growth spurts, like three four inches, oh wow, like well past where you know yeah. you think that's done. Um, one of my friends growing up, his dad was like five foot eight, coming out of high school, and he's six three. Oh wow, yeah, that's huge. Seven inches, good lord. Right at like a point in your life where it's like, well, shit, I guess I'm just five eight. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with being 5'8". No, not at all. 6'3 is a little bit better when coming to playing basketball. So, speaking of regrets, what do you regret not having done or tried before you graduated high school? Um, I kind of regret just being as antisocial as I was in high school. Um, especially with the kids at my high school. I don't know if that was me or I just didn't. I mean, I just didn't like the people I went to high school with for the most part, um, which, I mean, I went to, if you're anywhere near the Roseville, Sacramento area, uh, I went to Granite Bay High School, and which just has this reputation for being all the rich douchebags. And, you know, that reputation is pretty accurate. <laughs> um so it was, it was a lot of people that, you know, I didn't, it's pretty good. I didn't interact with a lot. Um, but then there's definitely more than a few people that I kind of wish I had kind of reached out to been, you know, gotten to know better while I was in high yeah. school. I don't think I consistently talked to a single person I went to high school with. I don't know if that's common or like just falling out from high school people, but. I don't yeah. know the last time I had a conversation with someone I went to high school with. It That's kind of an interesting one. I know people that have had friends, you know, you know, I knew this guy since grade school. And then like, for me personally, I have one friend who I kind of keep in contact with from high school. And so like, I, I know both sides of the tracks and I don't know if that's a function of, you know, which side is a function of Facebook, whether, you know, like making more new friends and easier to keep up with them or, Mm -hmm. you know, easier to keep track of old friends. I think it kind of plays both sides of the, of the line, but yeah, that's an interesting one that it seems to be either you have a bunch of friends from high school or you, you know, you find a different friend group later on. And, you know, I have friends that I've was friends with in high school, but they were, you know, people I met playing magic, um, that were, I mean, almost universally like old, like a decent chunk older than me um you know it's not that way anymore cuz kind of you know i'm s- still i'm like, i'm still like the young person in my in my friend groups for magic um i'm just slightly older now <laughs> time be like that yeah when did we met when you were in high school right 
probably well, you know, still, we met in medford that one time that ricky won i was just ricky. out of high school you were just out of high school Dang yeah it. missed it by that much that was a that was a fun trip <laughs> there's a lot of there were a lot of great things about that trip to be sure yeah. or at least from what i remember saying i got cryptic commanded off of racer verge thicket triple noble hierarch and died <laughs> uh, speaking of bizarre what's the most bizarre fact that you know to be true um this one's just kind of gross but i love it <laughs> um so um i mean it's, again it's pool related um that kind of chlorine smell like mm -hmm. when you walk by a pool um that smell is the compound that forms when uh sodium hypochlorite which is like the kind of uh it's, it's the chlorine they use to clean pools um mixes with urea so which is expelled through your pee and also your sweat <laughs> but a, a good bit comes out in your sweat i'm not saying just that smells 100 percent pool like pool pee <laughs> but as someone who has you know swam for my entire life pretty much it's just kind of weird that that you know that nostalgic smell really you know i'm in a hotel that has a pool on the second floor and like the doors open on the elevator and i'm like mm, that's almost like my childhood it's just <laughs> that's that's piss <laughs> that's pee right there yeah fill in the blank for me this weekend was so great i spent 13 hours watching football watching football you're an eagles fan right i am those three hours weren't great <laughs> um, we looked going into the season. I was very pessimistic. Um, I don't particularly like the quarterback we have. I don't think he's that good. He had, he's put up like numbers, but he's like a less a less athletic Lamar Jackson, in my opinion. Um, which Lamar Jackson works because he is anytime he walks onto the field, he is the best athlete there. Um, which has helped open up like he's he's improved miles as a passer. Um, he's such a he's a, such a much better passer than he was uh, back in whenever his rookie year was. All the years are blending together now. But I mean, what happens just, when you get old, son? Yeah, but I mean, if you watch this past game uh, where they beat the Chiefs. You don't say it a lot in football, but he carried that team. Like, he was the reason they won, kind of hands down. Whereas, like, other, you know, you, you can say that in basketball. You can say that in soccer, but you don't really say that in football a lot. Yeah. It's a lot more of a team sport. Yeah. Way more of a team sport. And would you ever bet against the Eagles if you felt like the line was correct? Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Money first, kinship second. Yeah, as uh, my friend, uh, you may not know, uh, Ricky's brother, actually. Yeah, I know. Um, he's a Bills fan, but, you know, he's a diehard fan of wherever his money is. <laughs> yeah, that, that I also believe to, quite believe to be true. Speaking of friends that we know... What's something you see in someone that makes you want to be friends with them? Um, empathy, really. Uh, it's the big one. Um, and just a drive. Um, empathy because it's just hard to talk to people, have like good conversations with people who don't view the world the same way you do. Um, or give a shit about <laughs> or, yeah, or give a shit about anything, right? Yeah. You know, it's hard to have a conversation about any issue where someone's like, eh, who cares? Yeah. Um and then kind of a drive where they're not super happy being in the same place they were. Um they're trying to improve themselves, improve their lives every day because otherwise <laughs> 
You're just kind of sitting around doing nothing. Totally. Speaking of being uncomfortable with where you are, what do you wish you had started sooner? Wish I had started sooner. Something that you do currently or did for a time, but wish you had, you know... Probably, uh... I started playing water polo is one thing. Um, When did you start? I thought you started pretty young. I started my freshman year of high school, which is when a lot of people start, but... Mm -hmm. Um... I just remember, I think since I was like, so I started about 14. Um, I remember for like a couple years before that, my mom was trying to like talk to me. He's like, hey, you should like give this a try. I've heard like good things about this. Like you're a good swimmer. Um, you know, maybe you'd like this too. And I was like, no way. I've heard horror stories about people bringing bottle caps and slicing each other up, which is ridiculous. Like that's not going to happen in a 10 year old. Like, and <laughs> as a 10 year old. Yeah. Um, and like, that's also just pretty kind of outdated kind of perception of water polo, which I mean, that stuff did happen. Don't get me wrong, but that was, you know, back in the seventies. But, uh, and that was the big one because I mean, once I started playing, I loved it. Um, there's so much, uh, even more so than swimming, but because I kind of got a late ish start relative to, the people, you know, I maybe played with in college. Um, some of the development stuff just wasn't quite there. I also, when I was in high school, was splitting my time between swimming and water polo. So I didn't get as much off-season work as I probably needed to. So my development definitely plateaued. Uh, but I would say playing water polo and then not giving myself kind of not deciding which one I wanted to do pursue further uh, mm-hmm. until later down the line kind of definitely hindered me in both. So, so on the flip side of this coin, what do you wish you had ended sooner? Um, one of my relationships in high school, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, is that one of those that you look back in time and you're like, Oh, I should have, or were there signs <sighs> that you see and been like, yeah, I should have paid attention to that. Like, huge glowing red stop sign of a circumstance i mean it's both um at the time you know you, i didn't see the red flags but now that you think of now that like going back i'm like mm-hmm. yikes those were <laughs> there's a lot of telltale signs those that were a lot the of them <laughs> but yeah i mean it was just kind of a pretty toxic relationship that lasted for like almost my entire like high school like oh. probably like three years um you know, it was just bad, and it kind of, I'm sure it played negatively into my experiences in high school, and probably why, it's probably a non-zero part of why I just had the disdain for myself at that time. Mm. If you could go back in time and tell yourself one sentence, what would it be, and when would it be? Buy Bitcoin 10 years ago. <laughs> um... I mean, it's kind of a joke, but yeah. I mean, if you could, <laughs> if, if you, if if you, you want to wake up tomorrow as Bill Gates, it's right. pretty, pretty easy and good way to do it. And it's yeah. like, hey, you remember that summer job you had? You had like 500 bucks saved up. You Put it in a Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. I was looking back. Um, somebody posted this on Reddit that there was this, uh, I want to say it was like a Halo term, maybe StarCraft. Oh, yeah, yeah I've seen like that. T1, it was like first place got 500. <laughs> Second place, like 250, top four, 100. And then if you got <laughs> fifth through eighth, you got like 25, 25 bitcoins. bitcoins. Yeah, it was like, oh, oops. It's like, if, if those people just held on to that, they made so much more than the people that got first. Right, just, you know, a thousand X was the other person made. But yeah, there's another great like, one where some guy's delivering pizzas. Yeah, he paid like 20,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas or something. Oh, no, I was talking about there was a guy who's delivering pizzas. Oh. Gets tipped in Bitcoin. The guy has enough cash to buy the pizzas. He's like, sorry, I don't have that much for a tip. He's like, hey, it happens. And he goes to leave and goes, actually, I have this, you know, this, like, (laughs) new thing. He's like, yeah, sure, I guess. And he gives him, like, a thumb drive or something like that that it's on. And it's, like, 100 Bitcoin or something like that. Some, you know, at the time, 
not big amount, but now enormous right. amount. And just like, he's like, all right, cool. Thanks. And puts in his pocket, you know, takes it out, puts it on his desk years later, you know, or yeah. however long later when it spikes and he hears about it and he's like, and just like goes <laughs> searching through all his knickknacks and finds it and yeah. you know, quits his job, is able to pay off his student loans, go finish his master's. Like, you know, it like changes his life this one serendipitous night, you know, right. where he didn't throw away this dumb thumb drive with his fake money. It's just like. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a story in like the poker community where some guy, they were like a couple guys, they're like ordering pizza for their just hanging out. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't have any cash. Like, I could pay you in Bitcoin. It's like, I guess. And so he sends them 20,000 Bitcoins, <laughs> which amounted to like $20 at the time. Yeah. And, just, you know, now, it's... Now, not so much. <laughs> it's like roughly $100 million right now. <laughs> hope, hope he didn't just like use it to buy a beer later that night. Right. I mean, it better have been some pretty, pretty good pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Life-changing. Uh, but, I mean, like, it's interesting. I've heard people, some haters of the way it's turned out and it's like that's the way that was meant to be used right like in these situations like they were using it as a currency where now it's used as like an investment resource like nobody's like really using bitcoin in like everybody's like holding on to it nobody's like spending it so it's kind of like yeah i mean the the way it's currently being used is against it's you know the only place i ever see it used like as cash is when people are like betting essentially yeah which i mean it's probably more of a thing like the poker community where it's like um especially like online poker Mm. um i was listening to um i think it was a daniel negranu like podcast he's like easily my favorite thing to do is cash a tournament on like a friday and then get paid out in bitcoin and then see if i've made more money (laughs) (laughs) It's a, it's a nice little free little sweat that I love. <laughs> Indeed. And with that fun tidbit, we're going to throw it to our first break. But before we do, if you could make sure listeners of this podcast heard one song, which song would it be? Um, I would go Alphabet Aerobics by Black Alicious. It's just a really lyrically intricate song. And it's, it's a fun listen, honestly. Sweet. All right. So, listeners, feel free to stick around and enjoy the totally real commercial we're about to play, or take a minute to enjoy Alphabet Aerobic by Black Alicious, or just fast forward. Either way, see you in a jiffy. Having trouble staying awake? Oh yeah. Wish you'd followed your dream so you had the give a crap necessary to meet your deadlines? Oh, definitely. Are you likely to be fired the second another warm body walks through that door and asks your boss for an application? I mean, probably. Would you prefer to keep this shit sack of a job instead of explaining to Susan that you've been fired? I mean, I guess. Well then, let me introduce you to caffeine. Caffeine is a highly addictive substance that'll keep you jittery and energized to do any fucking stupid task for hours. Uh, that sounds like drugs. It is. Aren't drugs illegal? Not this one. So next time you feel like sitting on the sidewalk instead of at your desk, reach for a caffeine. Wait, you didn't tell me where I can buy it. Because it's mother-loving everywhere, you blind Neanderthal. And we're back. Thank you for returning, sticking around. Hope you enjoyed that song. So, Merch, what is your passion? Um, My passion, only job I've really loved, is coaching. Um, I love working with kids. Um... And, like, the whole development process of learning, um, it's the same reason I'm going to attempt to get into teaching as well. Um, kind of helping kids discover their own passions. And, you know, if they're not passionate about what I'm passionate about, that's fine. Um, but um, when you get to see like the excitement in kids when they discover something they really, really love. And it's something you also really, really love. Um, it's just such a rewarding experience. Um, being able to like help guide them through all that, you know, it's almost like reliving it for yourself. Like, Oh, I remember first time I ever scored a goal, how, you know, how good that feeling was. Yeah. 
I first remember when that <laughs> athletic crack cocaine got in my system. It was amazing. Oh yeah. I mean, even just, just last night, um, we had a game, we got, you know, totally hammered, but one of the freshman's mom comes up after me. He's like, Hey, you guys have just created this monster in my son. He wants to do this in the off season. He wants to do this year round now. And for like an obscure sport, like water polo, it's just so cool to see that happening yeah. because this is something that, you know, he had never done like for life of me. I don't know how he decided to play water polo. He didn't have a swimming background or anything like that. He's like, Oh, this just looks kind of cool. <laughs> and to see that he just loves it that much is it's the most rewarding thing. So how did you come to figure out that this was something that you enjoyed? Was it like you ended up needing to do it and then fell in love with it? Did you experience this when you were still playing the sport? Like how did this kind of come about? Um, so my first coaching job was, 2014 i think um so i'm in i'm at junior college um one of the guys on the swim team he's a coach for a rec team and just casually like hey if you're if you're interested and i was like yeah i'll check it out just kind of a summer job kind of a thing um you know seemed like pretty easy money and i just did it and i'm Loved working with the kids, loved seeing them work, um, and they definitely, like, responded to me and, like, how I coach, um, which is kind of just a copycat of, like, my favorite coaches kind of blended together, um, and kind of a little a bit of, like, a positive feedback loop where, like, they enjoy having me out there, so I enjoy being out there kind of a thing. Um, and then I was going to school to be a pharmacist. Um, so I have a nice bachelor's degree in pre-health sciences, pre-health sciences um, that, you know, not exactly being put to good use right now. But I was doing that, you know, all year. And then the summers, I would keep coming back, coaching this job. Um and then I think I was was filling out applications for pharmacy school, and I just realized I can't do this anymore. Like I hate this, all of this, mm -hmm. so so much. Um, and so I just kind of sat back, um, thought about like the things that I did enjoy doing, and it came back to coaching. All right, well, what's the best way to kind of get your foot in the door? Coaching, teaching, um, it's kind of a natural pair with it. All right, so we're gonna go. We're gonna get, get a teaching credential, and go forward from there. What uh, what subject are you getting a teaching credential in? Um, I currently uh, science probably um, math or science. Um, I'm gonna take a couple more of the C sets just to kind of broaden my options. Right now, uh, as soon as I get finished the teaching credential, I'm I pass all the tests to teach high school chemistry. And just uh, beginnings, like the beginning intro level science classes. Awesome. So, is coaching something that you would continue to do even if it didn't pay you any money? Is this something that, like, you know, God forbid they, you know, cut funding or something like that? Is that something you would still stay and do at a school? Um,. If I was, if I didn't need money, then yeah, I would do it for free. Like if it was, you know, it's something that you enjoy that much, regardless of the right. If I, benefit. you know, if I ever, you know, won the lottery or something and just never needed <laughs> to work a day in my life, I would still coach. That's awesome. And you said you prefer college or junior high level, right? Yeah. Which, uh, what are you teaching right now? Or coaching right now? I'm coaching right now, um, junior high level and for swimming, and then high school level for water polo. Does is there is there kind of any spike in improvement between junior high, high school, and college that you've noticed with you know is 
do you think it's like tied to or one is there one and if so do you think it's just tied to like physical advancements you know like people going through puberty and stuff like that or do you think it's has to do with like cognitive advancements like people just like getting smarter over time um i definitely there definitely is one um 100 percent um i mean you see it all the time uh if you coach like a rec league like i had been in a while um the kids they swim for three months then they don't touch the water again for nine months and they just grow and get bigger and stronger and then they come back they're immediately faster than they were the nine months prior even though they aren't haven't touched the water in forever um so like you know, the physical side of it's definitely there. Um, we're coaching at a club like I am right now. Um, so it's a year round thing. Uh, it's smaller progressions, but you see that like, m- you see the mental side of it a lot more where, you know, you they're not improving every single meet. They're, but every once in a while something just like clicks you know maybe they've been training super well because of factors x y and z um you know they're more cognitive of their training and so there's a lot of smaller jumps there besides like the enormous one that is puberty Mm -hmm. that's really interesting that it both affect in starkly different ways but only both still make their own like you know kind of big upward jolts right if it was you know graphed out i mean like the puberty one they swim faster but like the mental ones they swim better Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a really random nerd comparative it's kind of like the difference between uh like darth vader and like luke skywalker luke skywalker is not well trained he just has raw talent where darth vader has just you know been this like badass of the force you know his whole entire life and even though he's like physically deteriorating is still just like bossing him around in empire right. strikes back because it's like yeah i'm just a better jedi than you i know yeah. like i don't have emotions getting in the way i've been using this same saber for a minute like and just cutting people down left right and center yeah what would you say your favorite like misconception about swimming is by the wider world like what's one that pops out that makes you roll your eyes and kind of, or just giggle a little bit that they don't understand about coaching or about water polo. I mean, just water, like swimming and water polo general misconception is that we don't pee in the pool. (laughs) (laughs) Every single serious swimmer I know pees in the pool. Just throwing that out there. (laughs) Deal with it. Um, You know, it's just, one of those things um like when i was in high school there were kids who would like get out go to the bathroom um but college swimming i mean maybe it's different for the girls but at least on the guy's side um if you got out to go to the bathroom it's because it was something you couldn't do in the pool (laughs) (laughs) the old number two yeah and you know i think the coaches I don't know. Almost appreciate it in a way because it's just <laughs> why the chlorine's there, <laughs> right? You know, chlorine neutralizes everything in the pool in like six and a half seconds. So unless you're like drinking pool water, <laughs> which you know, don't do for lots of reasons, um, <laughs> but you know, one of those reasons filled with pee. Um, but I mean, coaching like little kids they still hop out and like go to the bathroom and i'm not gonna lie it gets in the way of practice yeah when like one kid's constantly gone in the bathroom and i'm trying to explain something and then you know they have to re-explain it and then another kid has to go so he misses actually doing the work and it it gets in the way (laughs) just pee on your teammates yeah it creates a bonding (laughs) exercise is there a non-obvious aspect that you really enjoy about coaching that you didn't think you would or that most people don't realize is like a, you know, part of it? Um, the emotional side of it, which it's definitely part of it. Um, you know, I mean, when I thought coaching, I was like, all right, I'm going to help these kids like get better at this sport. Um, 
but then helping them deal with like adversity, like all sorts of adversities. Um, I think it just comes to like really good life lessons. And so it's, I've almost gone like a complete 180 where I'm teaching, I'm trying to like instill like good, you know, values, good work ethic, stuff like that into the kids. And I'm just using swimming to do so. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So like that's, that's something I didn't realize how much I would enjoy, but you know, when you, when you, I've coached one kid in particular, uh, since he was about 10 and he is favorite kid I've ever coached. You know, he, uh, shows up with a smile on his face every day and just puts the work into everything he does and you see it pay off. He was, yeah, he, he was the best swimmer on my new, on the team that I was coaching until recently. And he wasn't always that way. You know, two years prior, he was asking to be put in different events than one of his faster teammates and one of his more like talented teammates. But, you know, the hard work really got there and now kids are trying to avoid swimming against him. What did you so he was wanting to opt out of events where there was a teammate who was going to just beat him, basically? Uh, yeah. So the way like swim meets work, you can, there's a whole bunch of different events you can swim. Um, yeah. he was asking to specifically be entered in ones that his teammate was not in. So in that circumstance, what, it, what did end up happening? Did you swap his events or did you? No, uh, I, a... I put him in the events I thought was the best for him, best for the team. Um, it just so happened. They only overlapped in one event. Um, but do you think it would have been beneficial if it if it did not affect the team? Would you have put him in the easier events, or do you think it's no, better for him? Absolutely not. I think that's chicken shit. <laughs> how do how do you say that to a, a child though? When you want to you know be fair to them and not be mean, but at the same time um, want to help them improve. Uh, I mean, the approach I took was like, look, I'll look at it. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take who else is in the event into consideration. Um, I don't think you should either. I think you should go out and do your best regardless of how you think you may end up finishing in a race and don't let, like, don't be results oriented just because you got second place and, but you dropped a bunch of time. That's not a bad race. You know, it's all about personal improvement, not, you know, comparatively, you know, it's just kind of interesting talking about earlier how we were talking about like, you know, looking at races and it's like, it doesn't matter what your time was. It matters how you finish. Right. And it's like true in a way, but at the same time, it's like everybody should be looking at their, you know, it's think, all about personal improvement. Well, at the end that's of the only, day. I think that's only really true at like top level swimming and athletics in general, because you know, your times are how you progress. Are you like tracking your progression? But like when you're at that top level, um, you know, watching the Olympics, um, I mean, uh, I don't really think there's a good examples from this Olympics, but so I'll go back a couple years to like Mike, when Michael Phelps was crazy dominant. Um, his, you just have to, he did as much as he needed to do to win the race. And then he saved like every little bit of energy for the next event in his program because his program was just so stacked. He had so many events, so many races. Um, so it was just, it's energy conservation, Mm -hmm. um, at that level. But when you're, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a different national end. Yeah. hundred percent. But like, as you're progressing, you should definitely be, you know, balls to the walls at all times. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you're not winning, it's not that it's a consolation prize. Even if you're winning, you should be looking at this, right? But it, you know, looking at improvement, that that is like the best way to gauge yourself in like, you know, mental health wise. Right? Yes, to, absolutely. You know, especially in a sport so competitive and so fraught with, you know, variance because of, you know, you're changing who you're swimming against. And like the only thing that's right. constant is like yourself, that you are the, per- you're always... Regardless yeah. of the swim meet, there's always you that's in the water. And that's like the only constant you can kind of measure your yep. Absolutely. improvement or decreasement by. And then even uh, times where, you know, maybe you don't improve, 
to be able to look at like small things that you maybe you did better, like kind of ask yourself, all right, why didn't I improve this time? Something I did different in my training. Am I not rested? Um, you know, just minor stuff like that. Totally. Before we go on to our preposterous peeve, I have one last question for you. Since we've been talking about swimming so much, do you think Michael Phelps is a better swimmer than Mark Spitz? Or do you think he just had the opportunity of more events? Um, I mean, I think he's a better swimmer. Um, it's, but I mean, people, I've heard this like criticisms like, oh, Michael Phelps can like, I was only able to win so many gold medals because there's so many different events offered in swimming. And like, they compare it to someone like Usain Bolt, who, you know, three events per Olympics, the hundred, the 200 and the, uh, relay. And yeah, it's true. There's more events in swimming, but they're so different. They don't translate to each other super well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, best example of this is a British breaststroker named Adam Peaty. He's the fastest in the world. I don't know the last time he's lost that event. He's the only person to, uh, let's see no one else in the world has been under 58 seconds in the hundred meter breaststroke. And he goes 56 something. Jeez. Um, so he broke the 57 second barrier before anyone else broke the 58 second barrier, which is yeah, like massive in that event. Record. Yeah. Um, but that's his only event. Um, he's so dominant in that one event. And like, even you go to the longer, the 200 meter breaststroke, like, I'm sure he would compete fine at it, but you know, yeah. it's it's not his jam. He's, so this like is the one thing he does, and he does it damn good. You look at like Michael Phelps, the things he swam. You know, it's it's like saying like, yeah, Usain Bolt, he could have competed in the javelin toss too. <laughs> you know, he's, he's yeah. a world class athlete. I'm sure he could do it. <laughs> but you know, like the events he swam, they were just. Even the differences between like a hundred meter butterfly and a two hundred meter butterfly are, you can't really over overstate it. Yeah, it's not apples to apples. No, it's it's like the difference between like the hundred meter dash and the mile, instead yeah. of like the two hundred meter dash. That's a great way of explaining it. All right, now, from the philosophical and the fun to the preposterous and the peevaful. Merch, what is your preposterous peeve? People using, like, the wrong syntax of words or wrong, like, spellings of words or just, like, my favorite example, you know, I mean, the classic example is, like, when you're texting someone and, like, they put the wrong, like, two in. Like, they put two O's when it's the other way or vice versa, <laughs> which I never got that one. Like, if you're just going to spell all of them, you know, I don't know anyone who uses, like, T-W-O incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Thank God, because I think I might kill them. <laughs> but, like, knowing there's a difference, but then not spending the time to, like, know what that difference is. Um, and so, like, there's one person I know who, like, uses them just backwards, and it drives me insane. <laughs> um, you know, or, see, the, the your, so whether or not there's an E on the end or not, kind of gets me i don't i don't care if you put the apostrophe in there because we're texting and it's lazy <laughs> um i have to open up the like second keyboard tab to like get to the apostrophe so whatever um i don't fault anyone for not doing that and then like even yeah. like more minor stuff like i'll be talking to our friend ricky and he's like uh and he'll say something like hey i'm gonna come up this weekend when he lives north of me <laughs> So like, yeah. it's just no, super minor, down. just pedantic yeah. bullshit. That no, I don't know why. No, yeah, I totally get you on that one. That one drives me nuts too. When somebody says that, like, oh, I'm gonna come down to you. It's like, dude, I am north of you. That's yeah. not how this works. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a globe, and there's not like an up and a down, but right. you're still wrong. But there's, but there clearly is an up and a down. We invented yeah, it. There clearly, <laughs> yeah. The one that. Uh, that drives me insane in the subject is when you're talking to somebody, they use the wrong word 
and you like correct them and they're like well you know what i meant it's like yeah, yeah but words have meaning and then they come back with this well you know words change over time and as long as i'm correctly conveying my information and you're understanding it then we're communicating it like you know whatever no, I, I mean i think that's a totally valid argument you know it's like uh you know, when you're like a little kid in school, it's like, can I go to the bathroom? Do you mean, may I go to the bathroom? Yeah. Like, I, I I fully understand I'm being a pedantic asshole. Like, <laughs> like there is no kind of veil on that for me. Like, fuck, I'm probably in the wrong here, but it annoys me. <laughs> I'm in the wrong, but, you know, so are you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm technically correct. And that's the best. <laughs> the that's best the best kind, kind of correct. correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was fantastic. And with that, we're gonna head to our second ad break. But don't go anywhere because when we get back, merch is going to enter the lightning round. Stick around. Have you ever wanted to kill a small woodland creature or break a window but not had the physical strength? I know I have. Now introducing rock. Rock comes in a variation of sizes and ready to use. Simply put rock in your hand, raise it back to ear level, and release. See? You've got it! This ad does not condone the violence against small woodland creatures or windows, nor will it be held liable for any inability of use when coming into contact with paper. And we're back. Merch, are you ready to enter the... Lightning round. Yes. All right. Put however much time it takes to bake the cookie on the clock. Merch, is there a god? Nah. Shakira's voice in Danny DeVito's body or Danny DeVito's voice in Shakira's body? Uh, the Danny DeVito body. <laughs> Wine or beer? Beer. Are hot dogs sandwiches? Yes. You're having the best day of your life. What happens next? Another amazing thing or something terrible? Law of averages, something terrible. Lions, tigers, or bears? Bears. Is zero a number? Yes. Would you rather give up cheese or naps? Naps? Bow ties or suspenders? Bow ties. Have you ever paid more for a meal than you made in a week? Yes. Neapolitan or Spumoni? Neapolitan. No one's looking. Do you put the cart back or leave it in the parking lot? Put it back. If you had the power to see the future but couldn't change it, would you use it? Nope. Over or under? Over. Pineapple on pizza or fist fight? Pineapple on pizza. Can billionaires be ethical? No. Kill the spider or get an adult? Kill it. Red or blue? Blue. Is there a price for you to give up your passion forever? Yeah. Salsa or Lindy Hop? Salsa. Dog or cat? Cat. Which one of your parents settled? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> My mom. Sunny side up, scrambled, or hard boiled? Scrambled. Which do you max out first? Intelligence, charisma, or strength? Charisma. Did you ever cheat on a test in school? Yes. Pizza or pasta? Pizza. Popsicle or Klondike bar? Popsicle. Are we alone in the universe? No. Would you rather have your inner monologue sound like Gilbert Gottfried or Fran Drescher? Gilbert Gottfried. Are Cheez-Its addicting? Yes. Kanye. Kanye? Kanye. Yes. Congratulations, Merch. You've survived the lightning round. Hell yeah. Now, what lightning round question would you like to ask me and in turn be asked to future guests? Bone-in or boneless wings? <sighs> Bone-in. Like, value-wise, it's not there. Like, you're paying more for the bone, but just... I don't know. There's something that just feels more correct. You know, you're not getting that slurry, 
right. fried ball of chicken that isn't actually chicken, or that's like, like all of the chicken. So yeah, I mean, I think it depends. <sighs> it depends, honestly, for me. Um, there's something about just how much easier it is to eat boneless wings. Yeah, I do like that, but then it's just like these are just chicken nuggets, and like calling. Oh, them, sh- I sure. I really wish they just called it that. Is it like sure. instead of like boneless or bone in, be like, would you like wings or chicken nuggets? Because then it feels like a little bit more, you know, fair. It feels like a lot less like a hundred meter versus two hundred meter dash kind of right. comparison. You know, it feels like you're like cheating with that comparison, as coach. Sure, but I for ease, especially if alcohol is being consumed and you're not doing boneless, I feel like one of your games is wrong, you know? Yeah. Either your, your eating game is weak or your drinking game is weak, but either way, you need to step up one of your games. Yeah. All right. Anything you want to plug, recommend, places people can find you or your content? Um, I'm not super active on social media. Um, if I ever am active on Twitch, you can find me at Merchy94 if you want to see me play Magic poorly. Or uh, my Instagram. It's not super interesting, but same name, Merchy94. All right. Thanks, Merch, for being my guest today. And special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And especially thank you, everybody listening at home or wherever you found time to appreciate this. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, or just share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. Or if you already have and are out of episodes to listen to, don't worry. We put out a new episode every Monday at midnight on SoundCloud at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves, and on YouTube at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast, all one word with an ampersand in the middle. And remember, folks, if you lick a lollipop, it's normal. If you pick a lollipop, it's normal. But if you kick a lollipop, Susie Smith cries and you're uninvited from all future church socials. So don't do that. Have a good one.